and yes we are live over to you sri lata ma'am thank you mr fanindra good evening to all the participants welcome to our 10th session of change makers winter camp webinar series i am sri lata certified happiness coach professional mediator behavioral skill trainer and organizational development consultant with 30 years of experience both in academics and corporate world and also founder of section 8 company krishna sri paripurna foundation i am your host for the day and i have my co-host mr kushal over to you kushal thank you shri lata ma'am hi everyone i am kushal rumale i am a student of class 8 in vidyavadaka sangha sardar patel high school bangalore in this winter camp i was given the opportunity to share few key insights on research team work and team building through a well structured slide deck to encourage active participation i organized quizzes on the topic research for innovators team work and team building for innovators around 523 winter camp participants have been overwhelmingly positive reflecting their keen interest in these topic i'm proud to say that i have my own youtube channel where i showcase all my talent i have conducted digital skilling boot camp mentoring more than 150 students my ultimate goal is to become a successful entrepreneur thank you what do you shri lata ma'am thank you kushal earlier session i asked you i'm repeating please join me in your team when you become entrepreneur okay <laughs> all right so dear participants earlier session on team work and team building by miss anjali bai was quite action oriented with many practical examples right okay now we have with us dr major satish jeevanavar to discuss about products and solutions for healthy living sir it is my pleasure to invite you to our winter camp webinar series mr kushal will help us in knowing more about dr satish over to you kushal thank you ma'am it's my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker dr satish jivanavar dr satish is a physician and ex army officer he is the founder of the ai highway incorporation and ai first company that aims to make screening of chronic diseases cost effective at the primary care clinics which is the first point of contact for any patient he has been leading this venture since feb 2018 with the vision of achieving the sustainable development goal 3 of ensuring healthy lives and well being for all by 2030 He has also with over 20 years of experience across various sectors and domains in the healthcare industry. He has developed expertise in business development, innovation, market entry strategy, cross industry partnerships and policy. As a veteran physician with a, with an MBA from IIM Bangalore and a certification in M Health from Stanford University. He is passionate about leveraging technology and data to solve global health challenges and improve access and quality of care. Dr. Satish, being the member of the Healthcare Council, has contributed a lot towards shaping the future of healthcare in India and beyond. A warm welcome to you, sir. What do you wish, Lata, ma'am? Thank you, Kushal. Thank Kushan. you. Thanks, Kushal. Yeah. Uh, Dear participants, if you have any questions, please mention in the chat box. Satish sir will answer towards the end of the session. Right? Hope all of you have your notepad and pen. Right? To jot down the points. Okay. Few points about attendance. Attendance link will be shared on the Zoom and YouTube chat box, and the form will be open only during the session. Attendance should be marked only once for each. each session though the link will be shared three to four times for the convenience of the participants okay and uh, over to you uh, satish sir sure thank you thanks uh, shri lata thilata uh, ma and uh, the entire uh, organizing team of uh, change makers uh, it's a wonderful uh, pleasure honor to be part of this group uh, feels like uh, i am back to school uh, 
probably all of us uh, the, the most happiest times are when you are in, in school uh, so once again i thank you all for uh, inviting me uh, so what i'll do is probably i will uh, spend some 10 15 minutes uh, i have a presentation so i'll uh, just uh, walk you through that uh, so are you able to see the slides now yes sir Sure. So we can have it in on. presentation mode, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think uh, because uh, I'm I'm in the midst of uh, Gen Z and uh, millennials, uh, some interesting statistics. They say fifty percent of mm -hmm. India's population is uh, Gen Z and millennials. Uh, when I was going to school, if uh, someone asked me what languages you know. Uh, probably I would say Kannada, English or Hindi. But uh, I'm sure if I ask this crowd what languages you know, uh, probably they would say Python, R language. And uh, so the, the meaning of the terminologies itself has, has changed, I think. And uh, so I, I just want to walk you through some interesting trends in the last uh, 20 years, uh, right? So if you look at... Uh, how the pharmaceutical industry uh, operates, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll start a step back and I'll talk about when we say healthcare, there are five the patient and someone who treats the patient uh, is a physician. And uh, then we have providers. Providers are basically all the hospitals, the doctors and the hospitals come under the providers. And then we have the fourth P, which is the payers. Someone has to pay for all these services. Uh, so it's it's usually the insurance or the government. And in India, uh, probably a few years ago, it used to be out of pocket. But now, thanks to the government, we, we have the world's largest insurance scheme, which is launched. Uh, so uh, it's patient, physician, uh, provider, payer, and last comes the pharma, the partners, and, and the whole uh, ecosystem. So you will note that uh, uh, all of us at some point fall ill and you, you take uh, uh, some form of medicine. So for every 10,000 new molecules, only one of them is successful. So till about 20 years ago, for this new molecule to come to the market from research uh, for the doctor to start prescribing, it used to be a 20 year journey. So what I mean by uh, lab to bench side is it's basically used to be a 20 year journey. Uh, and uh, in the last few years, it, it was cut short to some 12 to 13 years. But you saw during COVID, uh, even India created a record. The COVID vaccine was launched in a record time of uh, about 12 to 15 months. So I'm, I'm just trying to share some interesting trends which you see in the last 20 years. So the research time frame uh, has been cut short uh, almost from what used to take 20 years. Now uh, it, it takes about 12 to 13 years. But COVID vaccine came in 12 to 15 months. The second one, what we call as the Moore's law, uh, this is basically the cost of compute. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you in this crowd uh, on, on today's uh, change maker session have ever seen a landline phone uh, or probably visited a PCO booth. Uh, when I went to the college, uh, we all grew up talking uh, over the landline phone. And if you had to call someone in a different city, we had to call the telephone exchange and ask them to book a call and then wait. And uh, when I served the army uh, in, in 2003 to uh, 2008, three years I was in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, no phones. Uh, only we used to get an opportunity to talk uh, back home on satellite phones, uh, probably uh, uh, once in a week, uh, or it could be a luxury. And then when I 
then moved out of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, we did uh, have uh, the mobile phone started entering the market. But uh, what this Moore's Law uh, basically says is the cost of uh, compute and uh, probably what you could correlate well uh, is like about 10 years back or 20 years back, uh, even an incoming call was charged. And uh, today, India is probably the third or fifth cheapest in terms of the cost of data. So as and when the compute, uh, the cost of computing has come down, you will see a lot of these new technologies have an infrastructure on which you can deploy this solution. So that's the second biggest uh, uh, trend. And third one, uh, probably when I, I was still uh, going to my medical school, the first human genome was sequenced. So it, it cost almost about uh, 2 billion US dollars. And uh, it took 20 years to sequence the first human genome. And uh, you will be surprised that today, in about one to two hours, you, you get the entire uh, human genome sequencing. This can be done at home and probably it costs some uh, 20 to 40 dollars or something. So, so the point I'm trying to drive home is like these are three big trends which have happened in the last uh, one or two decades while uh, most of you who are the Gen Z or millennials were, were growing up and, and part of the, the school. And uh, a very interesting take, uh, because when we say healthcare, most of us tend to think of hospitals, doctors, patients, uh, but, but it, it's very interesting to know that uh, almost 40% of socioeconomic factors actually plays a key role on health outcomes. Uh, what do you mean by socioeconomic factors is basically your education, uh, the kind of uh, family, social background, community where you stay, and 10% uh, is your, your physical environment. Like, uh, are you working in a uh, office with, with very little physical activity or uh, it's, it's someone like uh, India is predominantly uh, agriculture uh, economy, uh, right? Like uh, you go to the fields and, and so on. And, and then you have 30%, which is health behavior. Uh, all, all the habits uh, that you have, that result. So it's only 20% which impacts your health outcome. This is what we all know about 20%. The hospitals, clinics, lab, pharmacy, everything comes in, in this 20%. So uh, the, the new concept is something called as social determinants of health. So it's more than your genetic code. Your PIN code determines your health outcome. And, and why this is important for people uh, probably who are in, in Bangalore, I can give an example. Uh, whether you are staying in Indranagar or one street away called as Dupanali, uh, your PIN code kind of will determine your, your health outcomes. And uh, it's, it's very interesting to see that by 2025, healthcare will be the biggest contributor of uh, data across industries. And uh, you will see that uh, almost 90% 90, 90 of uh, data which we have in today's world is mainly from uh, the hospitals or the tertiary ecosystem. But when you talk of predictive analytics, it, it can't be a reality if you don't have the patient's journey captured from the primary healthcare clinic. And that's where we predominantly work. Uh, and also why the name of our company is AI Health Highway, because we are trying to connect the primary healthcare ecosystem to the existing tertiary care or the hospital ecosystem. So like when India worked on the golden quadrilateral, the network of highways, you saw that uh, the entire India leapfrogged uh, on, on various business metrics. So in a similar way, what we are building is a uh, health highway infrastructure connecting the primary care clinics to the tertiary or the hospital ecosystem. 
just a minute i yeah so compared to the traditional healthcare delivery uh there, there are multiple omics uh, which is like proteomics transcriptomics genomics and and so on but uh, if i ask uh, a question here where do you all guys uh, spend your maximum time it's it's with the digital devices so in a way uh, like how much time you spent in sleep uh, and and uh, going through your instagram or youtube reels uh, how much was your screen time so this is all again data about an an individual so a, a combination of the digital and device uh, interaction will give lot of insights which also has a bearing on uh, your health outcomes i'm not sure how many of you uh, would be aware uh, just uh, during covid because of the the increased screen time and interaction uh, i think now almost uh, more than 50% of the world uh, is myopic which means short sightedness so you will see more and more people uh, wearing uh, spectacles uh, and and uh, this is almost uh, like uh, Im impacted because of the the digital device interactions and the screen time that we spread so most of these next few slides are related to the uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning applications in healthcare i'll probably breeze through some of these uh, uh slides uh because all of you must have heard about the chat gpt the open ai uh these are not uh, just from the last one year two year but traditionally these uh, were under the field of uh, statistics and different but now it has become like a buzzword so all these new technologies uh go through what is called as the the hype cycle so uh this is uh, the gartner's hype cycle for artificial intelligence so you will see most of uh, the foundation models or the large language models it's it's at its peak of of innovation and usually after that there there will be a sudden drop because you will see again in the next 2 to 3 years there will be new technologies which is like creating the buzzword and and there will be a slope of en uh, enlightenment so probably 10 years back you used to hear a lot about computer vision data labeling cloud services so these are all mainstream applications now so this is something which finds the right product market fit and uh, only if it it makes uh, the cost effective sense for the customers then it finds uh, it it ways through uh, adoption with uh, the the population so i'll probably again skip some of these uh, traditionally the uh, machine learning models were were basically trained on huge uh, data sets uh, and that is where you see the examples of identifying a cat uh, or the self driving car experiments where you had to put a black box around that and so on so it was all based on uh, the supervised learning uh, you had lot of data sets which you would label a uh, train and and then the machine would learn but uh, one foundational difference between the the current uh, llms is uh, even without having uh, those kind of uh, labeling and data set uh, where the machine almost understands the context and thinks like a human being so that's one uh, huge advantage uh and you already see lot of uh, uh on ground applications uh for example you will you'll also see earlier when you used to uh, get into the bangalore airport you had to wait in in queue but now the digi yatra it, it kind of recognizes your face and in less than 2 minutes you have completed your check in so there are plenty of such uh, ai in healthcare applications uh to be precise close to some 600 applications Uh, have been cleared by fda and uh, more than 50% of these uh, ai in healthcare applications were uh, cleared in the last 3 years itself so that's the pace at which uh, innovation is is happening uh, and these are all uh, some of the current 
uh, large language models, either closed ecosystem or open ecosystem. Uh, all of this is available uh, on uh, the net. But I'll I'll spend just thirty seconds to one minutes one minute on explaining. Uh, you will see that this has got three different uh, color categories. Uh, when it says validated, these are topics where AI in healthcare is already being used. For example, in accelerated drug discovery, precision medicine therapeutics, and uh, automated document processing. Uh, whereas early stage is public health surveillance. Uh, the generative AI cloud services, these are all uh, at, at a early uh, stage R&D and conceptual is uh, even uh, one step uh, behind. Mm, for example, synthetic data generation. So I'll, I'll touch upon this uh, when, when I come to the specific uh, use cases. So now uh, quickly, uh, I will spend two, three minutes on what we do at AI Health Highway. So AI steth is, is an AI-enabled smart stethoscope to screen, detect, and uh, predict cardiorespiratory disorders. So this is the first product which we launched in India last year. So uh, a stethoscope is something which the doctors have been using for centuries together. It was invented by a French physician called uh, Lenek. And uh, traditionally, the doctors used to listen to the acoustic output from a stethoscope, uh, all of us know that the heart sounds, uh, what is shown in Hindi movies like lab dub, lab dub, so S1, S2. So the doctors listen to these heart sounds and identify whether this is normal or abnormal. And uh, a stethoscope is used for evaluating not just the heart sounds, lung sounds, bowel sounds, uh, and, and so on. So, uh, Currently, we developed this AI-enabled stethoscope and uh, it collects 30 seconds of heart sounds and it is streamed via Bluetooth to a smartphone, which is on Android and iOS. Once we record 30 seconds of heart sounds, it is uploaded to the cloud and the AI engine analyzes the signature patterns of the heart sound and identifies whether the patient has a murmur or, or not. Uh, and uh, the current accuracy for this murmur detection is 98.34%. When uh, the doctors use a traditional stethoscope, it is a subjective finding. The, the accuracy probably was only 50 to 60%. When cardiologists use the same stethoscope, the accuracy is 90 to 95%. So I'll tell you why this is important with a real life example, which probably you all will follow. So all Indians like watching a cricket match, right? So till 2012, the caught behind decision was taken by the umpires on ground. And uh, the umpires, two umpires who were there on the ground are like cardiologists or the experts. So if a batsman touched the ball, he would have that uh, guilt feeling and he would just look at the wicket keeper. They, they would also study the psychology and uh, it was a subjective decision. Uh, and the decision was taken by those two umpires. But in 2012, there was a instrument called as snickometer, which was discovered. So the what the snickometer does is it, it kind of analyzes the signature pattern, whether a ball touched the bat or the ball touched the pad. And now it's not just the two umpires, but the whole stadium can decide whether the court behind decision was right or not right. And not just those who are present in the stadium, but uh, even the spectators who are watching the cricket match uh, from home on television can also identify whether the batsman is really out or not. Uh, it, it's mainly identifying whether the ball touched the bat or not. So we kind of brought the similar technology which is used in cricket uh, called as snickometer to identify the signature patterns for cardiology screening. So it's now we have deployed some 200 of these devices across 12 states uh, in, in India. And uh, what used to take a cardiologist with uh, seven, 10 years of experience 
to identify this murmurs. Uh, I'm very proud to say that our team launched this solution last year. Uh, and this is deployed in the rural villages of Maharashtra, where even a Asha worker or a nurse can use AI step and identify these murmurs in 30 seconds to two minutes. So, so this is the power of uh, technology uh, and, and applications in uh, healthcare. So uh, we have now integrated uh, our, our solution uh, in the form of a MVP, even with Google Meet. So technically, like let's say if AI stuff is, is present on the other side uh, with any of you, uh, sitting here over a call, I can listen to your heart sounds or lung sound. So India for uh, 1.4 billion population, we just have 5,000 cardiologists. Whereas India has got six to seven lakh villages. So our idea is to take this device to most uh, villages of India. So even though there may be no cardiologist, but the nearest primary healthcare clinic uh, can use this device to identify murmurs, which is uh, used in screening of volvular heart disorders. And why this is important, uh, imagine a couple who, who is like uh, not from the not so affordable or somebody who works uh, uh, and, and on a daily wage and if their child is suffering from congenital heart disorder uh, and in a place uh, interior most rural village, they all have to travel uh, even today 60-70% of India's population has to travel 100 kilometers to see a specialist or to visit a specialist in a hospital. So they have to come to a place like Bangalore, Mumbai and get the investigations done, stay for two, three days. It's loss of daily wage for them. So there's a lot of indirect cost involved. But right now, uh, this device is, is deployed uh, in, in uh, the primary healthcare clinics. So you can get this initial screening done in, in villages itself. So uh, again, because uh, we are talking about technology and application, so far, uh, the doctors used to diagnose based on acoustic output. So only 30% or 35% of the population is acoustic learners, which is by listening verbal instructions you learn. But uh, 60 to 65% of the population is visual learners. And that is how you will see that the latest uh, technologies all rely on blended training, uh, it's not only about the audio, but you also are shown a picture of the concept so that the visual learning, when it is combined with acoustic learning, the reinforcement is, is more effective. And only 5% of the population is kinesthetic or touch-based uh, learning. So we, we kind of uh, brought all this uh, fundamental shift in, in technology. Uh, most of the Indian OPDs are quite crowded. There will be a child crying in the background, somebody pulling the chair, so many hundred different noises. And in that, a doctor has to use a stethoscope and identify the nuanced heart or lung sounds. So what you might miss hearing when you see this report in front of you, you, you can't uh, miss seeing these events. So this is one uh, major shift in technology. And... Uh, this is uh, where uh, you will see that last October, our uh, solution was present only in uh, about two to three states, Karnataka, Maharashtra. But in uh, less than a year, we have scaled this uh, across 12 states. And uh, while we deploy our uh, solution, we do a lot of capacity building and uh, training of the primary healthcare staff. We do a lot of uh, community screening camps. And the, the biggest impact right now is for the school health screening. So India has got about uh, 3 lakh children who are born every year with congenital heart disorders, which could be like a hole in the heart uh, or the baby will be born with a blue skin. So uh, almost uh, 75,000 of these such children need a surgery before their first year. Otherwise, they will not survive. Uh, 
so right now we do a lot of community school screening camps where we are able to identify these uh, children who have a hole in the heart and then refer them uh, to the hospitals. Otherwise, some of these will just go unnoticed and suddenly during some sports day, when you kind of uh, uh, stretch your physical limits, suddenly the child collapses and the consequences could be fatal. And uh, our solution has been uh, widely recognized uh, across the national, international conferences. I was very fortunate and, and you'll see that uh, the finance minister, uh, Nirmala Sitharamanji, she herself also uh, liked the solution and pitched it to various ministers. Uh, you will see the ISRO chairman, RBI governor, quite a few people who, who have been uh, uh, recognizing the work uh, that we have done. And this, this is our uh, partners so with whom uh, we have worked so far. Uh, and uh, all of this uh, would not have been possible without uh, the wonderful team uh, which we have and uh, a global advisory network. So this is the last slide. Uh, so I'll, I'll take a pause here and uh, probably will uh, request uh, Srilatha ma'am to uh, go ahead with the next uh, sequence of events. Thank you, Dr. Satish. That uh, AI stethoscope was really good. Wonderful. It can reach to the corners of the village and more people can get access to this. That's really wonderful uh, innovation. And it so suits to our series of how do we innovate through technology? How do we provide solutions? Okay. Dear thank participants, you, we will have a... Uh, dear participants, we'll have a fire chat round now and I request Satish sir to help us in understanding more about innovations in health space, right? So a few questions, sir. Uh, you have served in the army and you are now working with civilians, sir. So is there a difference sir, between the two in healthcare? If so, what is different? Could you give us some examples, sir? Sure. So, yeah, uh, so the way the army practices medicine is, is quite uh, different. Uh, and one fundamental difference is uh, in the civilian world, the patients come to the doctor, to the clinics or hospital. When I served in the army, and especially this is true uh, when you are uh, posted in field conditions, especially in Jammu and Kashmir or Northeast, uh, as a regimental medical officer, uh, I don't wait for the soldiers to come to me. The doctor goes to the soldiers. Like I was posted in on the line of control ahead of Baramula. So uh, we were on uh, the LC and we had some 17 different hills where all the soldiers would be posted. Uh, so if one soldier was not well, then I had to climb the mountains for four or five hours. Uh, so that's the fundamental difference where the doctors actually go to the soldier and treat him. Uh, here in the civilian world, you actually wait for the patients to fall sick and they come to you. The second uh, biggest difference is what we use as a triaging system. Because in a war-like situation where there are multiple casualties, there will be only one doctor and probably thousand soldiers who, who have uh, gone through some trauma. So we operate on a triaging system, which is save lives first, save limb second, Third is rest all comes third priority. So this is uh, like a framework to operate in low resource constraints. And uh, we adopted a similar solution for COVID. If you remember, uh, the government came up with a green, orange, red classification. So green is you can stay at home. Orange is you need to monitor day 3, 7, 14. And uh, red is means you need to go to a, a, a hospital right now. So we kind of adopted uh, the same principles and we had developed a solution for COVID screening as well. So these are two uh, fundamental differences, uh, I, I would say. And there are many more uh, because at the point of enrolling a soldier itself, there is a, 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 a very detailed uh, medical checkup which happens and uh, the army kind of takes only the fit uh, people. Uh, so, so these are some of the top uh, highlights. 
Thank you, sir. Sir, in times of, in terms of access to healthcare, based on your experience around the country, where or who are those underserved populations, sir? Are they only people in remote areas or are there other factors that result in people not being able to access good health care, sir? Sure. So, see, healthcare uh, always operates on three uh, challenges, right? Like access, affordability and quality. So, access in uh, the rural, like still, uh, as I was telling you, 60 to 70 percent of India has to travel 100 kilometers to see a specialist or uh, visit a hospital. Uh, but uh, access is not a problem uh, only in the rural parts of India. Uh, take the example of uh, even Bangalore. Uh, so we do a lot of community screening initiatives for the BMTC bus drivers or the cab drivers. It's although they have healthcare facilities in and around, but uh, their job and work schedule is such that it doesn't permit them to proactively go and, and seek a visit. So access means uh, different and uh, also the underlying fact is the urban rural divide. 80% uh, of uh, healthcare uh, doctors, specialist infrastructure is all concentrated in cities, whereas 60 to 70% of India's population is tier 2, tier 3 and villages. So this urban rural divide leads uh, to a lot of challenges. So what role do you envisage technology playing in healthcare, sir? Like more as enablers or to replace people, sir? No. Uh, so uh, I think uh, I get this question asked almost in all the conferences. Will AI replace the doctors? Uh, and uh, we have a standard answer. Uh, AI or technology will not replace doctors. It will always be an enabler. Uh, so what we say is uh, AI might not replace doctors, but Doctors who don't use AI will get replaced eventually. Uh, so basically, it, it helps in task shifting. Some of the repetitive tasks probably may not need uh, your valuable time. So it's, it's uh, uh, and in, uh, especially in uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning applications, uh, we use something called as the uh, human in loop technology. Because see, the machine does a good job of certain things, but the machine can't empathize. So human beings are good with certain things. They understand the emotions better. Machines can't understand emotions better. Uh, so you tend to correlate well with what the patient is sharing and not every problem needs a solution. Sometimes what they want is just someone to listen to uh, what they are sharing. So uh, and uh, whereas for the doctor, the patient in front of him is the universe. Uh, and he may not be able to crunch, let's say, last 10 years, how many patients I have seen, what kind of data statistics. So the machine does a good job. So when you use a combined uh, approach, that is where uh, the solutions are more uh, useful for everybody in the ecosystem. Thank you. Sir. It's a hybrid approach, both machine and the human being. Thank you, right. sir. So, what do you think of the many healthcare innovations that came up, sir, out of necessity, say, during the recent pandemic, sir? And what is that you like and what was that really terrible, sir? Give you, can you give us a few examples, sir? Sure. So, uh, I wouldn't say anything ter terrible or that sort, but it is more, uh, you have to see it from the, uh, the context of what happened in the pandemic. Uh, these were important milestones, uh, probably for the first time uh, in, in so many years, uh, you will see that during the pandemic, the doctors and patients were learning for the first time about a disease. Otherwise, it's always like a top down approach where the doctors knew more about the disease. And But uh, I think the news channel reporters were talking more about COVID than doctors. And so the, the information asymmetry was, was broken during the pandemic. But uh, I think... Uh, uh, what is called as the constraint-led innovation. Uh, in fact, uh, because of the issues which we faced with the manufacturing supply chain got completely stopped. So we had to stop the development of AI Stata primary product and we worked on the COVID screening, uh, pre-screening tool. So in those 18 months, we just uh, two doctors and four nurses were able to screen more than 10,000 families across uh, 
23 different cities of uh, India. So I think there were a lot of wonderful innovations, of course, starting with uh, the COVID vaccine itself. Uh, that's where I started my presentation. What used to take 12 to 20 years, uh, the vaccine came to life in, in just uh, about 12 to 15 months. Uh, and then you had a lot of these uh, remote uh, variables or uh, diagnostics uh, which were invented. Uh, so these will all help us be better prepared for the future pandemics. And uh, uh, one major contribution you will see that uh, telemedicine has been around for the last 30, 40 years. But always there was a fear and it, it never uh, found its way into the mainstream. Uh, and during COVID, there was no choice. Hence, you see the adoption uh, kind of uh, leapfrogged uh, and, and uh, uh, kind of teleconsultations, uh, remote uh, monitoring of vitals. All of these got adopted uh, during the pandemic. And, and now the benefits are there for uh, everybody to see. Thank you, sir. Sir, so in India, Usually we say that we don't have a great system for keeping medical records, you know. So maybe in army we do have it because it's such kind of an organization. So do you think, sir, finding ways to keep particular records and then dashboards to help the doctor visualize it quickly would help? Or would that be a space for some innovative ideas, sir? Yeah. So again, electronic medical records or the hospital management information system, uh, I think the Western Scandinavian countries and uh, US uh, has, has been uh, working on this for almost four to five decades. But even there, it is seen as an administrative task. Uh, doctors love to spend more time with patients in, in treatment and nobody likes the administrative task, but that is a necessity. Because uh, when you capture the patient's longitudinal journey, it uh, helps you make better informed decisions. So uh, I think uh, compared to 2010 and now, uh, there are a lot of uh, adoption uh, that we see for uh, these electronic medical records. But at the same time, uh, all of these are not like a straightforward good or bad kind of answer because uh, when the patient comes to a doctor, he wants to be heard. Uh, but let's say if the doctor is not paying attention to the patient and he starts typing like a clerk, uh, then it is seen as an impersonal uh, consultation. So you, we have to manage all these uh, nuances. The focus should always be on the patient. And that's one of the successful uh, or a key criteria for a successful medical product. Uh, it should be seamlessly uh, ingrained uh, in, into your practice uh, and the focus should not be shifted away from uh, uh, the, the patients. So medical records have a huge role to play and you'll see that the government has done a lot of, uh, uh, I think, uh, successful implementation, Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission. In fact, we are working closely with them. And uh, second, uh, we see India launch the world's largest insurance program. Otherwise, 70 to 80 percent of India's expenditure was what is called as out of pocket. So uh, similar to the UPI infrastructure, like let's say if we go back 20 years, we all used to stand in queues in bank to get our cash or withdraw money. And almost all the transactions used to be with the physical money. Now, one bad thing about healthcare industry is uh, we are laggards. Uh, probably what takes two or five years in a different industry, in healthcare, it will take 10, 20 years. But uh, once it finds adoption, I think we will leapfrog. So I think we were uh, one of the startups sent uh, uh, to the delegation to France uh, in VivaTech uh, and a couple of others, we were also uh, one of the startups representing the World Health Assembly. So uh, the world looks up to our digital infrastructure, which we have built, like even to buy vegetable, to pay an auto rickshaw, we use the UPI right now. So in the next four to five years, you will see a similar infrastructure in healthcare as well. Uh, and the government is doing a great job uh, through Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission. That's really great, sir. Looking forward to that now, sir. Sir, what do you think are the top three problems that the doctors face uh, today, sir, in India particularly? 
uh, what comes to my mind immediately, one uh, very disturbing trend is the violence against uh, doctors. Uh, and I, I think that demotivates the doctors uh, very much because uh, I think the healthcare or medical science is, is unlike other industries. Uh, while there are bad apples in all sectors, all industries, but still it's a noble profession. And all doctors, uh, I believe, by default, try to help the patient. Uh, but uh, you, you can't be a, a god uh, and always save lives. Uh, so when the doctors put in all the effort, but uh, still we see a lot of uh, violence uh, in uh, the ICUs or the emergency departments, uh, it kind of someone who is still motivated and tries to do his best. It's the biggest uh, demotivator. Uh, second thing, uh, compared to the software or the tech industry, right? Like you kind of finish your graduation and you start earning by 24, 25. But in healthcare, it's it's almost like a 10 to 15 year journey. Uh, so only those who are passionate and uh, really want to serve the people, uh, they kind of. Uh, join but by the time you you settle down and start your life it's almost like uh, you'll be in your 30s uh, right so you really need to be motivated uh, to to do that and uh, i think these are top uh, one or two things which uh, comes to mind and uh, also the ecosystem is uh, changing and we see a lot of doctors who are now interested in technology who do mba so a lot of uh, shift happening in the medical world as well Thank you, sir. Sir, we have over 600 young people listening today, sir, either on Zoom or on YouTube. So as a physician, what are those few things, sir, that you suggest everyone would follow from an young age for better health, sir? Well, uh, I think uh, doctors are good in giving advice. Uh, I myself struggle to do that. But the biggest advice is probably cut down on your screen time. Uh, what I have personally seen, uh, our interaction is more with the devices than with human beings. Uh, and I see that uh, uh, actually shifting uh, a lot uh, in, in uh, uh, like, let's say, friends, family, everywhere. That's the number one issue. And uh, uh, good old days when you used to go to a restaurant and all, we used to see people talking. But uh, nowadays, it's mostly all of us are busy with our screen time. It comes with its own uh, health uh, consequences as well. Uh, I think being physically active uh, and uh, getting up every day, going out of the home. And uh, so, as I said, like we are good in giving advice. Some of these uh, I myself struggle to follow as well. But uh, yeah, that's something which uh, the I, I'm sure like the topic of the session is change makers. And out of these uh, there, there will be at least uh, uh, significant change makers who will emerge out of this uh, room, I think. Thank you, sir. So last question, sir. When one is designing something for healthcare sector, what are some good places to go to, sir? Like websites, books or any people for more information from where can they get it, sir? Sure. So I think... Uh... If we can uh, closely look at, there is uh, something called as uh, Stanford Biodesign Program with uh, Ames New Delhi. That is specifically if someone wants to uh, work or come up with uh, some product in healthcare, that is one. And uh, if we look at the ecosystem, uh, which is there in Indian Institute of Science, IIT Madras, uh, IIT Kharagpur, these are all, uh, now you, you would have seen in the news, uh, like... Uh, at least I, IIS, Indian Institute of Science, uh, IIT Madras and IIT Karakur are all planning to come up with their own medical colleges. So this will become more of an integrated science because one of the biggest challenges, doctors don't understand the engineer's language. It's like a left brain, right brain problem. But when you have to build successful applications, uh, both needs to understand each other's perspective. So these are some uh, very good initiatives which is happening uh, in today's world. And also it's very important to understand uh, in most other industries, there is a buyer and a seller, but healthcare is not straightforward. That's where I started my discussion with five Ps. Uh, there is a patient, physician, provider, payer. 
So who is using the service? Who is the beneficiary? Who is paying money for that? It's quite a complex uh, ecosystem. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Satish, for detailing and clarifying our queries. And that was a great learning about how to take care of our health and how important it is to maintain good health and what are the innovations that were happening, etc. Right? Okay. Uh, Kushal? Yes, ma'am. Can you please share the questions that students have been asking? Ma'am, a few questions from students, sir. Sure. Yes, sir. So, thank you, sir, first of all, for your insightful talk. Now, I, I now place before you a few questions asked by the winter, winter camp participants. Sure. sure. The first question is that what are the challenges or strategic priorities related to health can be the best addressed, can be best addressed through AI? This question is by Ayushman. Sure. Uh, I think I, I would just uh, look at uh, probably flipping the question. Uh, rather than asking uh, it that way, I think in healthcare, always it should start from uh, what is the problem that we are solving for the patient or the doctor. So usually it's uh, either you are saving time or you are saving cost or you are improving the quality. So rather than force fitting which technology to apply, it should start from the problem statement uh, and then you will be able to identify the right technology or the solution for that. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, the second question is what are health and wellness products? So, uh, see, basically health is, is again uh, a, a wide uh, definition, not just physically being well, but uh, mentally, socially, emotionally, uh, that's like a standard uh, definition. So wellness is, is more comes uh, towards the preventive and the primordial part. So it's like probably if you stick to the 30 minutes exercise five days in a week, uh, that is like one recommendation which goes towards being healthy. Uh, health and wellness products again would have a lot of supplements, vitamins and, and the food. So in a way, uh, I personally feel lot of uh, health, when you say health or healthcare industry's problem is not from healthcare. It's, it's basically about what you eat, how much you sleep and how much you walk. If you take care of the other three things, you, you will tend to be healthy most of the times. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So the third question is, what is your perspective on future of healthcare? Sure. I'll just uh, touch upon a few trends. Uh, so Traditionally, there has been uh, primary health care, PHC clinics, then uh, tertiary care hospitals. So in the next 10 years, uh, all these large hospitals are being disrupted. And uh, earlier it was considered that uh, self-diagnosis uh, is uh, dangerous. But uh, right now, Google gives you a lot of information, but that can be dangerous as well. Uh, so you will see a lot of uh, the information asymmetry being bridged. And uh, I think a lot of these multi-speciality hospitals are moving towards a single speciality hospital trends. And uh, especially on the medical devices and diagnostics, if you look at the CT scan, MRI, chest x-ray, all these big bulky devices are being miniaturized and uh, we'll see a lot of point of care devices. If you look at it, probably in 5 to 10 years, your smartphone will be the biggest medical device. It already captures uh, how much you sleep, how well did you sleep or not, uh, and uh, about your stress. It can give an indication about your uh, saturation of oxygen. Like almost hundreds of applications are there uh, on, on the smartphone. Yeah. Okay, sir. We move on to the last question of the day in the session. So, can technology be used in accelerating the process of vaccine creation? And can AI provide insights into that research? Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry, I, I, I didn't get that. So, can technology be used in accelerating the process of vaccine creation? And can AI provide insights into that research? Yes, absolutely. So that's one major area in identifying the clinical unmet needs. 
and uh, accelerating drug discovery. That's one big uh, area where technology and AI can play a key role. Uh, and uh, already in one of the slides which I showed, uh, where there is some early work, where uh, you are still at the conceptual stage. So all of that, uh, we already see uh, some use cases, which is already being worked in those areas. That's a perfect fit uh, for, for technology applications in healthcare. Yes, sir. Ushal, I'm seeing some people writing questions. Can you ask one more, Ma? Yes, ma'am. I see people asking some questions. Uh, can you ask one more, ma'am? Yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, I shall take a few of them. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, um, one more question is that. Yeah. Uh, which what what defines something as a healthcare product? So I think. Uh... Uh, a product which is used uh, for the better health outcomes of a patient or to, let's say, uh, as I said, save time uh, of the doctor in doing some repetitive tasks. So I think one of the first questions which you asked also asked about the AI applications in healthcare. So maybe I'll just uh, add further points on that. So uh, most of the AI applications in healthcare that we saw is in the domain of radiology, pathology, uh, because we already had huge data sets, images, and, and so on. Uh, and it, it becomes uh, easy to get access to the initial data sets uh, in, in the pre-processing labeling and then training them. Uh, that is how most of the initial products that we saw or applications we saw were in radiology, pathology, and probably dermatology and, and so on. Yes, sir. So one more question. What is human genome sequencing? So it's, uh, I, I think uh, all of us uh, have the ATGC, right? Like adenine, guanine. So that's the signature pattern of our uh, DNA, right? Like the first human genome sequencing kind of took 20 years to uh, uh, encrypt uh, that. So it took almost 20 years to first uh, kind of get that out. Uh, and then we spent like $2 billion. But now uh, all this, uh, the next generation sequencing is used to identify uh, like let's say a particular disease or a medication. Let's say if somebody is suffering from cancer, what is the best treatment suited? It depends on which uh, genetic alteration happened. So the human genome sequencing and the tests helps in identifying uh, what might be the better suited medication or it can help you understand from where the disease is getting originated. Yeah. Sir, one more question. Uh, the last question. Um, yeah. How can machine learning algorithms improve early disease detection? Yeah, very good question. So that's the area that uh, we are working on. Uh, I will just give you one or two uh, insights, uh, right? So you just think of how a Google search engine works, right? Uh, if you say, what is your, then it will most likely predict that the last word is, what is your name? Or if you ask how are, and then it probably predicts that the next word would be, how are you, right? So similarly, uh, if you look at uh, any disease, uh, take the example of a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, right? So it's not that suddenly overnight uh, it has developed. It's There is a sequence of events which started happening two years, five years down the line uh, because of probably uh, your diet or because we are South Asians, we are already, already genetically predisposed to certain diseases. So if you don't follow the proper diet, the cholesterol starts accumulating and then one fine day it will block a uh, artery. So... Uh, when you look at, uh, I'm not just talking from the AI step or the heart sound perspective. So all these are signals. So when you have insights about the patient, you can actually predict what is going to happen next. So these are all not uh, mainstream applications, uh, but we already have something called as the Q-Risk score based on a population risk assessment. It can identify in like, let's say in 100 people, 
what is the probability of someone having a heart attack in the next 10 years? Uh, this gives an indication on what is modifiable, what is non-modifiable. These are already used by doctors to start the appropriate treatment and so on. So multiple diseases uh, give some early signals. If you don't give enough attention, then it lands into complication. So this is where uh, machine learning helps in identifying those features or patterns, which is probably difficult for human beings or even a trained doctor sometimes. So that is how uh, the ML and uh, AI applications are uh, very useful in probably identifying patterns which might get easily missed by human beings beyond their compute power. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. That was the last question of the day. Over to you, Sri Latama. Okay, thank you, sir. sir. I was remembering the old saying which goes, health is wealth. And uh, the COVID pandemic practically demonstrated this fact as almost every family, sir, lost one or two of their loved ones. In today's world, where we are forced to live amidst pollution, either air, water, soil, sir, understanding about health and new medical interventions become very essential for happy living. What I suggest the participants here is the young minds take the cue from what sir was just explaining us, right? And with your young mind intelligence, you can create or innovate new things that can save so many lives. That is what we are looking for in having these sessions. Okay. All of us, I think we enjoyed such informative and educative session from sir. So shall we all show our happiness with clap emoji, please? Say thank you to sir with a clap emoji, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed you, being sir. part of this session and I uh, sincerely hope uh, there will be quite a few change makers from the participants. Uh, sir, two seconds with the students, sir, on a brief up, sir. So, dear participants, hope all of you marked your attendance, right? Those who attend the session only will receive the participation certificate. And you know that it is also mandatory to have 100% attendance to qualify for the prizes. The quiz will be shared at the end of this session. That is both together at 9 p.m. and will be posted on the website. And also I'm seeing a lot of uh, the students raising their hands and asking questions. Do remember. Here in Zoom and YouTube, we are having almost 400 students plus and we have only one hour with us, right? So only few questions that we were able to answer. But you can put all your questions in the chat box. We have participation admin four groups and I'm seeing one or the other organizing committee member is answering also. Okay, so please post your questions there. All right, so excuse us for not able to ask all the questions here, right? Okay, thank you once again, sir. See you all tomorrow at 4 thank p.m. You. with thank another you. quite interesting session, right? Bye for now. Thank you.